All right, so here I am in our inaugural first podcast with Roy O. Singh. And just before we went live, I have done probably as much to to uh, insult the act <laughs> of saying your last name uh, because I've misspelt it. I have, uh, you know, butchered it and... You you gave me a nice heuristic about singing a song. How and it, it's something someone should never forget how to say your name if they if they say this before they're about to say it. Say well, your name. Seriously, I I had to forgive you for the misspelling of my surname because you're not the only one that it's got it wrong. In fact, I've I've been hit with so many different combinations and permutations of a relatively simple name. Uh, of O-Sing. And I used to say, look, it. I mean, if you can say O-Sing a song, then you're going to get my surname right. I mean, that's just the way it is. I mean, I've had I've had O apostrophe S-I-N-G. I've had O S-I-N-G-H. I've had all sorts of, I mean, I've had people meet me finally go, wait a minute, you're not Oriental. Like, nope. <laughs> you just had the name wrong, dude. Get the name right. Anyways, it's simple name. Uh, once you sing oh sing a song then you'll never forget it even you yeah. won't forget it then. I mean that's it yeah and what a great way to start off your show we let's at least get the name right get the Boy, name it's a, hell of a, it's a hell of a place to start <laughs> that's right that's right so I mean here's the here's the subliminal uh, you know work at play is that the the ethos that is Roy has everything to do with Basically, be different or go home <laughs> or stay home, basically. <laughs> well, it's, it's so, true. I mean, for me, this this whole be different or be dead journey that I've been on for literally decades uh, started out really, really young in, in my life and my career where I figured out that everybody around me was really not doing a heck of a lot in terms of it started out with a career focus. And. And my observation was that the crowd of sameness was so huge that it was an incredible opportunity for me Um, because I didn't I don't like sameness. I don't like rules. I don't like any of that stuff. And if you read my my articles, you'll read about dumb rules and all this kind of stuff. So I figured out relatively early that that the whole principle of figuring out how to break away from the herd, how to stand out in ways that are meaningful to the crowd that you serve or to the people that you serve. I'm not talking about just being an idiot for an idiot's sake. I mean, behind the idiocy needs to be a strategy, Daniel. I mean, that's the point, yeah. right? But I figured it out and, um, and and I started to live it and I learned how to apply it in different ways. I learned how to apply it in in the various functions of business that I was responsible for. And I had a really, I was very fortunate. I had a great career with BC Tell and laterally tell us. And I had an opportunity to practice this stuff, which a lot of people don't have. And I learned more and more about it. Hell, I'm still learning about being different, being dead uh, every day of my life. I apply it to being a grandfather because I have four amazing grandkids. So I am the be different papa. And that's the way they talk. I got it. Well, that's 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 wonderful. So you live and breathe your philosophy. I I I um, am somebody that uh, you know I'm I'm a philosopher as well, and I think I hear this trope out in the the mainstream that it's 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 um, like live your philosophy. Don't do as David Hume did and have a hobby horse philosophy. And I I can kind of take that um, you know with a grain of salt because the thing is is that David Hume offered such a um, a an important piece to philosophy so you know i kind of still take that with it. but the wisdom is there that you know embody it you know like live it um practice what you preach all of these other kind of uh, truisms right well, so it's, it's absolutely right like um i i talk about eating your own dog food and what i mean by that is it's more than just the words okay the promulgation of words is easy and many people do it, you know, in, in many, many different sort of contexts. But the fact of the matter is, if you cannot translate or transform or morph words into action that's meaningful and relevant to people, then you're a fraud. You're an absolute fraud. You're dishonest. It's intellectually dishonest what you're doing. And I personally have no time for it. So execution 
in terms of what you believe for me is critical. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and if you carry that with you and everything that you do, it will lead you in the right direction. You will be successful because that will separate you from everybody else, the pedantics out there that love to talk about the words, but quite frankly, are at a loss when it comes to, well, how do you implement it? I'm all about how-to stuff. All my stuff is how-to. And it was easy for me to write it because I did it, right? <laughs> it's stuff yeah. that's grounded in pretty good um, uh, academics. I say pretty good because I wasn't driven to be academically purist because there's no such thing. I mean, only the academics think they're purists, right? So I'm a practical guy. I want to get things done in the trenches that satisfy customers and people. So I had to take what was generally an idea that, that was grounded in some pretty good basics and execute the hell out of it better than anybody else. That's all you have to do. That's all you have yeah. to do. Yeah. No, I agree. Um, <clears throat> I want to go back just in, in uh, one point. Um, for people that may be listening outside of British Columbia, which is where, you know, both of you and I are from the West coast of Canada. Um, there are two references to like BC tell and TELUS. Now these hmm. are, uh, the utilities company and the telephone, uh, conglomerate, I guess. So, um, yep. you, you were pretty, um, pretty successful in both of those, uh, Endeavors. Your resume is quite impressive, I guess, with with working with these companies. <laughs> well, I mean, I started. I, I will, look at. I'm I'm unusual in the sense that I've only had one basic employer. Okay, and that was the telecommunications industry. Initially, f with a company in British Columbia, Canada, called BC Tel, relatively small company. I joined as a systems analyst in the data processing department. You know, I because my background is math, so it wasn't a bad place to start. And then laterally, uh, had the opportunity to move around in that in that business. And 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 then later on, um, we we merged with another telecom company in Canada, and then bought a um, a wireless company in Canada to become Telus Corporation where I served in a number of capacities ranging from advanced, we started the internet business and grew it to a billion in a relatively short period of time in terms of sales. I was a chief marketing officer when I left. So I had, basically I had a, a window on every function in business with the exception of finance because I didn't want to be a CFO. I mean, that's a that is, that's not that's not a nice place to, to be. I had them working for me, but I didn't want to be one. And so I guess my resume is a function of having an opportunity to move around in an organization that was under transformation. I mean, you got to remember back in the day, this whole thing, you called it a utility. It was it was a monopoly. Then all of a sudden, all hell broke loose. And it suddenly became, because the regulatory environment allowed it to, to be this way, it become high, became, became highly competitive. I was sort of in the vortex of all that, trying to figure out what that meant to the business and what it meant for me personally. Okay, and what it meant for the business is, wow, we had better start taking on a strong marketing focus because this isn't about flogging stuff anymore. This is about competing for the right to serve people. Right. So I had to do that. I had to figure out, OK, how can I get myself personally in the mix of this opportunity so that I could gain advantage over everybody else who was trying to um, promote their own career? So it was a hell of a hell of a journey. And I got to, a chance to I was chief marketing officer. I ran business units. As I said, I started a, a business and grew it um, and uh, run customer service sales organization. So I really really had a good career, really, I was given the opportunity to do a lot of things. And my basic, and look at, for anybody out there, okay, just watching this, the key to this whole thing is in the state of flux, find a niche and execute. It doesn't have to be perfect. Get known as an executioner. I was known as a utility. <laughs> as an executioner. <laughs> I was known as the executioner. I mean, there'd be a problem over here. Go get Roy because he can execute this. He can get this problem yeah. solved and get it done, right? It's not about figuring out, you know, the right way to do it. It's that, but it's also doing it. It's also doing it. It has to be doing it. 
Yeah, be an executioner. Yeah, be an executioner. So one of the aspects <laughs> that I want to really weave into each episode is and is the um, uh, the quotes. You have this list of I, I just briefly looking at the number, right? I'm thinking there's very close to a hundred quotes. Yeah, there's probably more than that because I, you know, if I, I this will sound ridiculous, but every I was just before we came on, I was just reading some of my my blogs, and I thought, wow, well, I don't know where I came up with that one, so I wrote that one down. So it's a it's a it's an organic document, and and I just. I just sort of stuff streams depending yeah. on the mood I'm in the point, depending on what's front in front of me, it just streams out and it does it that way because I have this, this crazy desire to express things in, in my way. I have my own voice, not the voice of the crowd, but the voice of Roy. That's what I want. And I've got to, yeah, I, I, I put a hundred down and I'm pretty sure if I went through, I mean, I've been blogging since 2009, for God's sake. So if I went through this thing with a fine tooth comb, I'd have a lot more than a hundred, but it's fun. Well, yeah. Well, it. we're, we're going to do kind of a quote, uh, an episode, right? And uh, so we have plenty before I have to send you back to the drawing board. And I imagine if you're like me, you have this ability to write down as it comes. So it's a growing list. Right. True. So, OK, so the the quote that I want to bring up um, follows the hashtag Roy Osing quotes. This is what we want to put at the end. It's not, you know, it's not, uh, you know, your dates. It's a rather new phenomenon of the hashtag. Right. So that's kind of the idea. Cool. The weird shall. No, they must inherit the earth. Oh, yeah, man. I mean, it's absolutely the case. And it goes back to, to the fundamental precept that says up to now, factories and crowds and floggers have basically run business and determined what people shall and shall not have. It hasn't been a world where 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 the, the organization has been created in the image of the customer. It's been a world where the organization determined what the customers shall have. And it was a function of scale and, and economics. Okay. It was, is what can we push out to the masses cheaply or as economically as we could uh, and hope that as many people picked it up. So it wasn't about what does Roy look like and how should we cater to him? It was, which would require you to have a really close up view of who I am, right? It was more, let's look at that herd of people through a telescope. We can't see their images perfectly, but we know they're big. Let's go after them. That philosophy, mass marketing, has predominated um, the world and business as we know it. And, and it's dying. It's dying because people, now have a choice to be weird or not. I mean, it's, it's, this is not an issue of how you're born. It's what you choose to do with your life, what you choose to be with your life, who you choose to be with your life. And never before has there been so much choice available to people. The very fact that people have an opportunity to look at a podcast like this and choose that, 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 they, wanna, that they wanna be a Liverpool fan <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, that happens. It never happened in the past. It would be, do you want to play football? Not, do you want to play Liverpool? Do you want to be a Liverpool fan and know everything there is to know about Mo Salah? And so that whole change is opening up um, this this focus from my perspective. That's so important it is is like it, people you're using the word weird. Not in a negative way, but in a in a way that describes the choices that we have to actually not comply in a in a positive way. I'm not talking about you know non positive uh, non compliance. I'm talking about we choose not to write inside the lines. Yeah. We choose to write outside the lines because that's who we are. Now the the key here is that that class of thinking, that class of person 
is growing so fast, so fast that indeed, if organizations don't get onto it, they're going to miss it because the masses won't be there. The weird will be there. And they're not just perhaps going to inherit the earth. They will. They will. Yeah. So you see this as an inevitability. And, you know, I mean, I, I think the case could be made that this is this is a function of, of complex systems. I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to de, I'm not trying to dehumanize the conversation with these kinds of terms, but it's just where my mind was going that, that we're uh, as societies, we're getting more complex. Um, and, uh, yeah, we, we kind of have this decentralization of, of institutions thanks to technology. So it actually, it empowers people to be able to do that. Well, the interesting thing is fact factories, and and it's not my term, it's Seth Godin's term, who's a, one of my marketing mentors. I mean, he was right when he said, look at this whole marketing thing started because factories produce stuff for the masses as cheap as they could. And so the marketing job was relatively easy. But the problem is now with all of these, as you call them, systems enabling people to choose. And it's all about choice. That's it. It ain't about how you're born. It's about what you choose to do. It has now given people so much power in the marketplace that if if organizations don't get onto this, I call it marketing me, me marketing. It's like, look at me as a human figure out what I'm all about, et cetera, and then go find other weirdo Roy's if you want and start marketing to tribes of weirdos. If they don't, if, if organizations don't get that, then they're in for a lot of difficult, a lot of trouble. And the ones that are able to get on that, they're going to be the ones that are going to be winners because their target markets, if you want to use the, the, the traditional term are growing exponentially as we speak. But the other thing that's going on is social systems, not just, you know, you got technology, you got social media, politics is moving away, quite frankly. Well, Roy, let's forward. let's pause on the politics for a minute because I have a really important um, piece to bring in that I think is really relevant. Um, and it does validate our, our model at, at Planksip, a publishing company and media outlet, it was, you know, for thought leaders and this type of thing. And what I didn't want in our group um, – in our collective is I didn't want to have writers and thought leaders that were trying to write Wikipedia articles. I didn't want, I wanted, there's something that you hear in an author that, that is the writer's voice. Have you heard that before? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, the idea is, is that you want to cultivate this writer's voice, right? And um, something that's unique to Roy, something that's unique to Daniel. Right. And so I didn't have to stumble on that business model. It was like for, for, for Plank Sip, it was almost immediate. It, it's, it's right in its core as an institution, as a brand. It's, we are about the individual. We're about the individual. And as the individuals, the collective of individuals all build their, in our case, personal branding, then all tides kind of rise, right? It's, it's, it wasn't about the Planksit brand per right. se. Right. That would be a nice byproduct. But I was, I thrive on the ideas of, you know, thought leaders and people that say, how about we do this kind of a project? How about we do, right, this kind of yep. uh, presentation, right? Well, you're in the right slipstream for sure. Yeah. I mean, that's where you want to be. Absolutely right. Uh, the thing that I find interesting is at this point in time, you know, people that that talk about such things as cutting the crap or entering into the bear pit are few and far between because most people have been taught to have a conversation a certain way. They've been taught. Roy, really, I haven't heard those terms before. Uh, what would you? No. Oh, well, they're my <laughs> terms, of course. Um, no. <laughs> Cutting the crap is very much a part of how I talk about one of the biggest problems in business, which is pe businesses define innovation as doing something new. Uh, I happen to believe that the bigger part of innovation is getting rid of the crap that's preventing you from doing something new. And so I talk about in my work how to go about cutting the crap 
actually in your business, in your life, for God's sakes, in your career, to actually expand your capacity to do the more relevant things, right? Like typically crap would be something that was relevant maybe five years ago, but it but there's people in the business that love it and own it so fondly, they refuse to let go of it. That's part of the problem. And so when something new comes along that has to be done, they start arguing for more resources, which of course gets turned down because the margins go down and it's an endless cycle. Right. What I used to do is say, look, before, before we're going to talk about taking on a new project, which is really important, we should do that. I want to know what crap we're giving up. And if you can't find some crap, we're not doing a new. Now, people would say to me, yeah, but Roy, what if you can't find any crap? And I'd say to them, well, I, quite frankly, that's bullshit. Every organization, every person, every person's career has got stuff that is so nice to do, but in the cold light of day, probably is not as relevant as it was 36, 45 months ago. So the cut the crap notion, and if you look through those quotes, Daniel, you'll find one, speaks that way. All I'm saying is, my observation is, um, I don't hear... I don't hear the language, right? The cutting language that I use, and I'm not saying I'm right. I'm just different. By the way, that's another concept. You don't have to be right. You don't have to be best. You don't have to be better, but you have to be different, okay? But I'm not seeing that anywhere. Around. I'm, not, I'm not seeing it. And one of the things that people pick up on is, wow, that's kind of a neat concept. Well, if it's an old one, it just means you haven't heard it because people don't use it around you except me. Mm -hmm. I'm the only one that does, right? So... That we're still at a point where school, well, we could do a whole session on this, where the mm -hmm. education system is forcing compliance, and that actually stultifies the ability of people to break away, choose to be different, because it's ingrained. You know, we're taught to do certain things in school. We're not taught, we're taught, taught to be like Johnny and don't get noticed, right? For God's sakes, what did our mothers tell us? Roy? <laughs> don't step out of line all that stuff as adults we remember hmm. right we remember it in terms of the way we think about life we remember it in terms of the way we think about our job and that creates this inertia for us to to do for example what the heart attack grill does in las vegas which is market triple heart attack triple bypass burgers <laughs> <laughs> Triple bypass burgers. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, so I get it. I'm, but I'm, I, I guess maybe my, um, the devil advocate in me, or the, uh, you know, trying to throw the other side of the the, the perspective into the equation is that there's got to be a room for some conformity. Uh, is there not? There's is is there a yeah. time to say, okay, yep. Roy's different. He came up with an idea. Now we all got to get behind this. So like, where does so a line? blur as opposed to well i don't uh, all i can tell you is yeah i don't want somebody winging it when they're flying my airplane right okay. i don't want people winging it when they're when they're giving me a double hernia operation yes in other words there are yes of course there's areas for conformance the point is though we should always be on the lookout to do meaningful and relevant work outside of those boundaries because in business, in business, that's where it's important. Maybe not in the operating room. Maybe not in the cockpit. Maybe not on the space shuttle. But I'll tell you, sitting in a marketing organization with hungry competitors around you trying to kill you, it is totally relevant and you must do it to survive. That's where the whole be different or be dead thing came from, Daniel. It, mm -hmm. it didn't come from, you know disrespect i mean my father-in-law was a doctor he was amazing he took out my appendix when i was a kid no he was a cool guy but i wouldn't want him <laughs> practicing his golf swing when he was taking him out no because exactly. that would have been something different to do so yes there is a, ro a role but it's a specific role and the problem is as soon as you say yeah there's a role then people go okay it's all right then i'm conforming so it's okay well i refuse to say that I, I, what I want to do is say yes, and here's where it's absolutely critical, but here's where it's not critical. Here's where it's needed. You need to be weird. I want to see weirdness. I want to hire weirdness. 
over yeah. here. And the reason is because it creates value for my organization and me personally. And it's okay. relevant to the people. It's relevant to the people that I respect and need. In the case of business, it could be customers. In the case of, of your career, it could be mentors or it could, you know, that sort of stuff. It could be partners, of course. Yeah. And so, yeah, um, it, it, there's people, I find sometimes they're, they're too willing to excuse their non-weirdness by finding a reason to comply. And that's what, yeah. what's, what the problem is. That's a good quote, by the way. I didn't write it down. And no. I will have forgotten it 10 minutes from now. <laughs> I know this happens, you know what? And, <laughs> but we're, I know there may be a push to want to go through several quotes, but I think it's part of the tension building. We'll do one quote. And so, you know, the weird is going to inherit the earth. There's a, there's a, there may have like a religious undertone to the inheritance of the earth kind of concept, right? You know, like a little bit of a play on that. I don't know if that was your intention, but inheriting of the earth is kind of um, like the rise of the new, the new norm, right? The new norm is now being weird. Everybody's just weird. Right. And uh, well, well, let's be careful. Let's talk about this a little bit. I mean, we don't want to, I don't want to cast this notion in, in, in terms of what, how we traditionally might think about stuff like this. I right. mean, it's a highly um, reverent way to think about uh, business success because I want to ground it there, right? Because this whole thing, if, if you don't have value in terms of your ideas, then, yeah, I don't want to talk about them, okay? I just don't because all that does is make you feel good. What I'm looking for as a, as a business person fundamentally is what are the sorts of things that we should, what are the protein spikes, right, that we need to help our organizations thrive and su survive in a, in a world that is so turbulent, we can't predict what's going to happen 24 hours from now. I mean, five-year plans are not only ridiculous, they're deadly. My son used to say, Dad, my long-term plan is what am I going to do on Friday? And I used to think that's ridiculous, but the fact of the matter is today, Long-term planning, in my view, has got a 24-month horizon. So we need to start to think in those terms. And so when I grab a word like weird and inherit the earth as being mm -hmm. not shall, they must. What that yeah. suggests yeah. is yeah. it suggests is we need to empower people to be weird. We need to recruit people that are weird. I mean, Steve Jobs did it. He's a pretty remarkable dude. He did it. A uh, guy by the name of Tony Shea, unfortunately, passed away. CEO of Zappos. My God, what a business model. Can you imagine women actually buying shoes without trying them on? <laughs> yeah. Zappos did it. And he came up with this whole delivering happiness cultural conversation. And it was fundamentally one of the biggest planks said, we want weird. And so... His value system, his culture, I mean, his employee development, everything was built around that notion. So this wasn't a throwaway. This was strategic. Weird is strategic, okay? Exactly. Don't, it's not a fun concept to play with. Otherwise, I wouldn't be frivolous about it. It's, it's really not weird for being weird for weird's sake. And I think I want to talk about politics for a minute. And I want to throw out... I want to. I want to. I want to. I want to propose something that I think you would think. Okay, <laughs> but it, it, it's something that philosophically we we wrestle with, uh, at least politically. So there's a a, a rising um, conversation in our political discourse that has to do with um, virtue signaling, social justice warriors, right? And and these may be terms that I'm. Um, uh, you know that may be may limit that 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 certain group of people. I, I I get that, but I'm stereotyping a certain group of people that um, are hell bent on changing social causes, um, and the um, and and they basically point to um, you know of course it's good to give everybody X or do this or be you know, nice or nice person. And so from that group of people to have those people is different. Um, it's very hard to get, um, you know, from a business perspective, from a valuation perspective, 
it's very difficult to figure out what you do with that. Now, if you talk about from the business world, you can say, well, innovation means something. It means that we can do something in a way uh, we can innovate, we can provide something, we can enter into this marketplace and um, enter into relationships of exchange, right? So do you see the two worlds differently or, you know, like? No, I no, I don't. For me. For me, uh, if you're if you're sitting in, in a business and you're trying to figure out how you're going to grow it, um, I talk about my uh, strategic game planning process, which is a process that I actually created myself when I was running a the, the data and internet business. Uh, when most consulting uh, approaches were so goddamn pedantic, I mean they were they were a cure for insomnia. Uh, at the at the very best, and they weren't completely useless. So I created my own process that literally can be done in two days with a team of leaders. Right? Part of that process was deciding what I call uh, how big do you want to be, which is what kind of growth goals do you have over the next twenty four months, and who do you want to serve. The who do you want to serve is a strategic issue. You don't just assume that you serve everybody. Because the fact of the matter is uh, no two customers are the same and no two customer groups are the same. You want to pick those groups of people that you think have the latent potential to deliver your revenue goals. So back to the, the, back, back to the social discourse conversation. If any one of those tribes of outliers right, has grown to the point where they represent a good financial opportunity, then by all means, they should be considered – and they should be understood in terms of what their what I call cravings are, not needs. Everybody markets to needs. I, I, I believe the, the operative word is is cravings. What do they crave? Just like any anybody else. But but they have to earn the right to be served by reflecting in themselves the potential that makes it worth my while to go after them. Hmm. It's, it's merely on that basis, Daniel. It's not based on any judgment, any filters. It's just pure, hard evidence of, can you satisfy my growth goals? That's it. Well, you know, what's really interesting is that I must have struck something organically with you that, that you know, because we have an, you know, like we have uh, an exchange of sorts, right? I mean, the activity of doing and committing to um, a weekly podcast, right? This is a big, this is a big deal for two execs and business owners to say we're going to take for sure, some time out of our schedule every week to produce, and so there there must see, be something uh, in terms of how you perceive plank sip. And I know from my standpoint, um, it, you know, there's there's some value there because I I think you're very interesting, unique, different, all this these kinds of things. But as I speak with you, um, you know, there there's a there's a foundation of wisdom that is. Um, that that's my main draw is 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 the wisdom that I think you have. Um, well, but the other the other side of that is to figure out how to how to actually monetize it. To be quite blunt, um, I, again, um, wisdom and knowledge without without the ability to um, create value from that that people are willing to buy to be crass is of interest, but really you can't keep doing that. I mean, that's just the way the world is, right? I mean, so you need to figure out a way to transact so that both people are rewarded. Some people want, don't want money for rewards. They want something else. Okay, well, that's just going, to, going a bit further and, and you, just, you just figure that out, what makes sense to both parties. But at the end of the day, um, I'm not an altruist in terms of this journey I'm on. Don't ever think that that's my case i want to change the conversation out there maybe that's a bit altruistic but my belief is that if we're able to change the conversation away from compliance and conformity to being different in weirdness then i think a businesses will do a lot better in terms of satisfying people and that's a good thing yeah. people will be a lot more satisfied because they will be listened to. That's a good thing. Shareholders will be satisfied because those businesses that are doing that 
will earn greater profits and their dividends will go up. So their retirement plans will be more healthy. And that's a good thing. So I, mean, I can draw this microcosm of what we're talking about. I can, I can embellish that into a bloody spreadsheet that shows exactly who, what stakeholders are going to get positively affected and why it's a good thing. I mean, this is not a crusade, right? It, this is not, I'm sorry, this isn't, no, I'm not going to say it. This is not a crusade. This is, yeah. this is a hard-nosed journey of satisfying people and reaping the rewards of doing the right thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, you guys notice everybody. Everybody noticed that uh, you know Roy held back there. He was uh, he was going <laughs> to say something. <laughs> and we don't know what he was going to say. But I've had the pleasure of speaking with Roy, and he he's not afraid to speak his mind. So I'm just silently wondering what what that was that pulled back on no, the reins. We will move on if we. <laughs> well, but just just to be as transparent as I can. I mean, I. I just think that there's a lot of posturing going on these days around things, around stuff with nothing else other than self gratification in mind. Sorry. That's just how it, that's how it view. I view it. And, and, and sometimes just causes just in my, that's my filter. That's Roy's filter. They don't get heard of because they don't make the same noise and they don't have the same sort of, uh, acrimonial you know response from people that others do and i just say i just i just try and do my best to to sort of point to those that that i think are are creating relevant compelling value to people they're not lying they're not posturing they're not creating a platform that says hey look at me i've got this really really cool weird uh, plank that I'm trying to promulgate because there's a lot of those out there and I quite frankly have no time for them. <laughs> well, we got to be careful because that's the name of our, our brand is plank set, right? So we have a, well, we have a, yeah, plank. I know, but we that's, have a plank. <laughs> yeah, well, okay. But that's, that's the thing when you pick a generic name, right? So, yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's however, interesting your use of the word plank because we don't, I don't yeah, actually you can't do that. You, you have a really solid brand and it means something. It doesn't mean plank in the traditional sense, and that's why it's going to work for you. So, do you know what that that reference of like a plank in the eye? You know the biblical concept. Do you know what that's about? No, no? Hmm. a plank in the eye. Something like that. I can't remember what. It, I'll have to look it up and maybe bring it into the into next uh, next next week's recording. It didn't um, have anything to do with plankton, did it? <laughs> no, no, no. But plank, like a piece of like a piece of stick or something, right? Yeah, or, yeah. Uh, well, that's probably like someone poking sure. you in the eye or yeah. something, right? Yeah. But it's like I do hear this, like platform. We have a platform for this and a platform for that, and uh, I've had to um, really, really make that secondary because it's it's not about the platform; it's about the people, um, and yeah. um, but allowing the people to be different. Like really, this is what it was all about, and. Um, if anything, as our friendship and business relationship grows and, and, and uh, you know, I, I, I really think that, um, you know, there's some value in just, um, you know, just us talking with each other. But I do think that, you know, there is some natural cross fertilization between the, the, the hunger that that our membership uh, is 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 looking for. And, you know, we do focus more on academic um uh, interests, I suppose, like, you know, whether they're contributing writers or, uh, or interviews and that type of thing. So, um, you know, by bringing you on Roy, this is, this is interesting. Um, but I'm, but I, I agree too. I mean, I, I learned so much outside of the worlds of academia that, um, you know, I mean, and I, and I mean, from being a business leader, right. I, I learned that from, uh, you know, working in the back of an ATCO trailer in Calgary, Alberta, right? And uh, we yeah. had our four four thirty safety meetings where the, it entailed a, a rum and coke in your hand, and if nobody moved, nobody got hurt, and that was the whole point of the uh, safety meeting because you know everyone was pretty pretty much intoxicated <laughs> <laughs> at four thirty every day. <laughs> yeah. Well, I I think I I think you've got. Um, um, 
a, a pretty a, a pretty high potential way of looking at at content. Um, and I think the challenge is to bring the right audiences together with the right people that you're collaborating with. And that's always the challenge. And I think it's great that you're you're mixing things up. Look, I I enjoy I enjoy listening to academics. Okay, but I guess the thing is, um, I believe that everybody has a specific role to play. Academics have a specific role to play. The problem I have is the world has defined that role has been all encompassing in some in some areas, and I disagree with that. I'm an executioner. Get the idea just about right. Get the organization heading slightly west, execute the hell out of what you think is right, and learn what isn't right on the way and tweak it. That's right. strategy that works in the real world where you can't formularize events that strike it. Yeah. And that's my deal. Because I've you never know, seen a business being run by formula. Are they yeah. used? Of course. Of course they're used. They're used to inform, not to decide. Yeah. And the problem is we've been taught to have them decide. Yeah. And I say, I'm not having any of it. Yeah, you know, out of all my business experience, um, I, had a, I had a lot of experience in the construction industry, uh, in architecture, uh, and engineering. And I would say that from a project basis, the engineers are the um, – the toughest to work with when it comes to doing a project the way you're describing it, because yeah, totally. they want to plan everything to make sure everything is a hundred percent before it's released. And, uh, I, you know, I just don't, I just, you know, it's just too much. It, it's just well, too all, much. Yeah, you have to have, you have to have, you have to have a philosophy about this just to play to your, your, interesting bent. I mean, first of all, you, you have to either believe that perfection exists or believe that it doesn't. Now I happen to be guess on what side, right? I don't believe perfection exists at all. In fact, I think success comes from doing a lot of imperfect things fast. And that's the whole world of tries and they've, other people have called it failing fast and all this other stuff. Uh, but the idea basically is to accept the fact that you're never going get, to get it perfect. Interesting guy, um, uh, where did I put it, has written an article. Um, it's called The Cult of Done, which I would, I would recommend that, that your, your viewers watch. I um, uh, can't remember his, the author's name. But the, the gist is it's, it's, a, um, uh, it's, a, it's a mantra about doing stuff. Hmm. And it's absolutely brilliant. There's about 10 or 12 points that he talks about, which is, you know, like uh, everything's a draft, right? Uh, perfection is boring. It prevents you from getting stuff done. And that's what you're talking about with a certain group of people that keep keeps trying to squeeze that last 5% of perfection out of their work. Now, again, I'm not talking about the guy doing an appendectomy. I'm talking about a person sitting behind a business desk trying to figure out where the hell to take this machine. There gets to be a point you got to ship it and learn as you run, and that's that's kind of like the world that I've I've been in and 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 find it really comfortable. I find it frustrating as hell to run into the people that, that you're talking about that just want to study it. It's called paralysis by analysis, an old term. But let's overstudy this because if we're finished, we're going to have to make a call. And I don't like the personal risk associated with making that call. So let's keep studying it. Hey, politics is a classic where, world where that happens, right? It just happens all the time. That's because these aren't business people having to earn, earn their way through a billion in sales. Otherwise, they lose their job. They lose their family. They lose the company. Yeah. Yeah, well, I agree. I agree with that. You, you talk about even social causes. So it's I, I'm interested in that difference between the overlap of social causes. I tried to bring it up and maybe it, it was a little bit baity, but I, I, I was making some assumptions and I, ta I tested all those assumptions and they didn't, you know, they they didn't you didn't fall into those assumptions. But what that really means is that you could have a nonprofit organization, um, you know, that has any interaction with a uh, a, a public and to say, you know, Roy can go into that organization. Uh, totally. Leaders can emerge in that organization to say, look, 
we understand how things are typically done in this or in this in this industry or to like say raise funds for um, you know a good or just cause build awareness any of these kinds of things but you got to be different you got to be innovative you have to try and do something that's unique otherwise you'll never get noticed so i in my career and i've done this quite a bit of this i've sat on a lot of not for profit boards and for sure i'm glad you brought this up because this isn't just about the bottom line of of positive net income it's about organizational success at whatever level of return you want. It could be zero in the case of a not-for-profit. So I've sat on the, the, the board of the Cancer Foundation. I've sat on the board of the BC, at that time, BC Heart and Strokes Foundation as a chair of the marketing committee where I started to encourage them to think about donor marketing in a way that nobody else did. And I got to tell you, I ran into some, some significant pushback when I started to talk about donors as customers because... I mean, that's a pretty emotional place to go. Um, so, you know, it, we, we had varying degrees of, of success, but I've lo- done a lot of planning for not-for-profits, trying to figure out their strategic game plan about, you know, the donor segments that they should be going after and how they should go after them. And, hey, listen, you have competition, guys. That was another concept that, that people had a really difficult time here. You mean... We're competing with other, yeah, you are. Like you have a limited amount of donor dollars out there. You know, what makes you special to actually convince that person to give them, to give you their donor dollars? That kind of conversation was uncomfortable for a lot of people in the not-for-profits because they've never had those conversations. It's been a different world where maybe it was easier to get money. Uh, but it is not easy to get money and you have to get money. One of the things I tell them is it's okay to get lots of money, right? It doesn't, it doesn't sewer your cause for God's sakes. It doesn't make that what you're going after not right. In fact, if you want to achieve your social goals, if you want to, if you want to make a dent in cancer, you had better get a lot of money. Otherwise you'll fail. And so those conversations I find are so interesting. And especially when you see, when you see the kind of the pupils dilate suddenly and they go, okay, it's not about slamming the cause that I'm investing my volunteer time in. And I go, no, it's not what it is at all. It's about you getting the most out of your volunteer time as you can possibly get. Let's talk about that. Yeah. It's, 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 it is the, the, the true measure of, of, of success, and I want to be careful here because money is not the the measure of success entirely. But if you are using that as a metric to say, look, we have a plan, we're moving towards something, we realize um, economic growth, right? Um, You're on a right track. You're doing something right. Well, what is it that you're doing right? I mean, you know, it very easily can be argued that you can get money in nefarious ways as well, right? I mean, you can lie, you can cheat, you can swindle people out of their money. Uh, that obviously is not what I'm uh, encouraging here. But we're saying we're making the assumption that that the uh, you know the the advisor, uh, you know, the business guru such as yourself or the organization like Planksip, we are gaining success and we're gaining traction because we're providing value to people. That's the idea. Yeah. Look at, um, you're looking for what, what is the common denominator that people talk about when they talk about growth? Well, for most of the world, uh, people might say, well, you know, we want to get more donors. We want to get more authors. We want to get more blah, blah, blah. Those are actually drivers of a higher order result. Okay, that higher order result typically is what kind of revenue stream do you want to see? And that will always break down into, well, in order to get 150,000 whatevers, we're going to have to get this many customers, this many new customers every month, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It breaks down into those indicators that you're just talking about. But, but th- the thing that I've learned is if you, if you simply build around activity, you will never know whether you've been successful because being successful de- it actually presupposes that you want to, you, you know where you want to go. And the knowing where you want to go is kind of like a very specific process in terms of saying, 
what kind of growth do you want to see? What customer groups do you want to go after? How are you going to compete and win? Because there's always going to be competitors. And then look at your performance relative to those decisions that you made. And then you decide, okay, I made 85% of what I thought, I want what I wanted. You make the judgment as to whether that's you're okay with that. Or you've made 150%. You decide whether you're okay with that. You can apply this to, I mean, hell, I, I've written articles against why I think resolutions are so stupid, mm. right? I mean, they're absolutely dumb because they're all that way. And they're, they're, they're kind of like what I call a helium-filled mission statement, which nobody, they don't understand. And, and it, it doesn't break down into those, those kind of like drivers that you can measure that would be influencing the outcome. And so I always take a step back and say, okay, I understand that you want um, 15 more authors in the next 12 months. But I want to go above that. I, I, I'm not happy with that. I don't understand what you're trying to do in your business. So let's have that conversation first and then talk about how that translates into how many authors you want. I'm just using. Authors um, as a relevant like, example. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, but it, it applies really, really um, uh, well to not-for-profits to talk about donors because they all everybody wants to talk about donors, right, without talking about how much revenue do you want to give Right. The cancer society. Well, yeah, let me show you one. I'll give you, you gave it. You were very gracious to give a couple of examples of some, you know, some organizations that were uh, like near and dear to your heart and some organizations that you've helped out in the past. Um, two come to my mind. Uh, I'm on their email list. So I'm on Greenpeace's email list. Mm -hmm. And I'm also on a uh, rather recently. Um uh, and then also on a one for uh, the E.O. Wilson Foundation. And so E.O. Wilson's foundation is more about, you know, biodiversity um, and um, conservation, this kind of thing. Right. And then we all know what Greenpeace is about. So the issue that I see on the on the newsletters that come out is that 90 nine percent of the of the content on that email is asking us to donate. Well, I, I get that, right? Like I get the email from Greenpeace. I get the email from E.O. Wilson's foundation. Donate. Here's a link. Donate. Here's the link. Donate. Right. And it's like somehow for me, it's missing the mark, right? I want to get involved. I want to provide value. I want to be able to differentiate within your organization and make a difference. But I don't want the on off switch to be put your money here or just keep walking, my friend. You know what I mean? Oh, do I know what you mean? So uh, there's a couple of quotes that we'll end up talking about eventually called product flogging. Now, this is your sales worst nightmare. This is a salesperson or organization that, that and it's typically out of the factory model that we talked about earlier, right? That's, that's, that's mandated to sell as many things as they can. So I call it product flogging. The thing can be a product or it can be a cause. And it's all the same. And it's the most, it's the most harmful, uh, rude, discourteous form of marketing that I've ever seen. So what you're doing is you, you are being, and, and look at, I mean, there's tons. I, in fact, I've, I've not seen a, a cause marketing uh, strategy executed in a way that made me feel good. They're all, well, here's who I am. I'm such and such, and I want you to donate. Okay, where is the element in that whole selling proposition that says, okay, let me remind you what we've done and what has been what has turned out to be really valuable for these kind of people let me tell you why i think you should donate to my organization versus any other organization cuz i understand that you have limited resources where the hell's that none of them do it they just say okay you're on my email list therefore you've indicated an interest therefore i have the right to hit you between the eyes with a with a selling proposition and ask for money it's incorrigible. Right, right. Incorrig you know what? Incorrigible. So on that note, guys, I'm just looking at the time and 
we've got to go. That's the end of our first episode. But Roy, how did you think that went? I thought that was great. And I can't hey, wait. Listen, to I, I measure everything in terms of feelings. I felt like I had fun. I enjoyed the conversation. I really did. It was great repartee and I can hardly wait for the next one. Awesome. Thanks, Roy. You Appreciate bet. it. Talk See to you later. later. Bye. Yep. Cheers.